Uh, I'm Elliot Gerson of the Aspen Institute, and I've had the privilege of, uh, of getting to know uh, Ricardo Salinas uh, Pliego now for <clears throat> a number of years uh, because he has joined the board of the Aspen Institute in the United States, and he's really also the founding, founding father and board member of the Aspen Institute in Mexico, our first Aspen Institute in Latin America. He, of course, is one of not only, thank you, <laughs> he, is, he is also, of course, not only one of Mexico's leading entrepreneurs and most successful businessmen, but frankly, one of North America's most successful uh, uh, business leaders. Uh, he is the founder of Grupo Salinas, uh, with interests in telecom, media, financial services, banking, and retail, uh, more than 90,000 employees, one of the leading uh, 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 businesses uh, in, in North America. Uh, he was educated in his native Mexico and the United States, and the businesses uh, in Grupo Salinas include Azteca Television, one of the leading producers of Spanish language television in the world. Uh, he recently sold his cellular business, you probably read about that, to AT&T for two and a half billion dollars. Uh, he also is perhaps the leading philanthropist, both personally and through his foundation, Foundation Azteca, uh, in Mexico. Uh, and they have a particular focus on the environment, education, health care, and nutrition. Uh, entirely coincidentally, even before he first came to the Aspen Institute and the Aspen Ideas Festival, he started and sponsors a program in Mexico called the City of Ideas in Puebla, which I recommend to all of you every November if you can't get your fill of the Aspen Ideas Festival here. He actually has his own Ideas Festival in Mexico, and it's all in English, and it's really quite spectacular. So you could see that he already had very much of the Aspen spirit even before he got involved with the Aspen Institute. Uh, given his stature in the Mexican economy, it is no surprising that he is a leading public figure in his own right in Mexico. And as a matter of fact, his blog is the most followed blog in all of Latin America. Uh, I want to mention one other thing, and, and that is among his philanthropic interests is a remarkable set of youth orchestras. I think they're now, what, close to 80, Ricardo? 82. 82. Uh, 79 of which I think are in Mexico, uh, that bring young Mexicans, many from enormously disadvantaged uh, conditions, introduces them to the magic of music, and it's incredibly inspiring. Uh, some of you had a chance to see uh, this one, a, a small sample of the youth orchestra just a couple of days ago at Pepke. And before I begin my interview, I'd like to show all of you, just a short, I understand we have a short video uh, of what happened right across at Pepke just two days ago. And it got, I, I don't know, how, how many standing ovations? There must have been 10 standing ovations and not a dry eye in the room. Can we roll that, please? Perderte, perderte después, después. 
actually, under, under Ricardo's uh, generous sponsorship, there are actually 16,000 students in Mexico who participate in these youth orchestras. Finally, one other thing I do have to mention is that Ricardo is uh, very proud that he is neither a friend nor a business associate of Donald Trump. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so he, ha he has had no need to sever any ties uh, over the last couple of weeks. Uh, but our, our topic today is the future of Mexico. And given his great personal and business investments, I think we could find very few other people to speak about this uh, so authoritatively. And, and the topic couldn't, I think, be more important either. Mexico is obviously, its future is obviously critical to the future of the United States. And I think also in the context, let's, let's be honest, of US media coverage of Mexico, which is mainly about crime, drug cartels, and corruption, and very little else. I think it's very important to understand a, a good picture of Mexico today, a complete picture, including the terrible challenges it has, but also the enormous successes that it, it has had. Uh, it's really become one of the great success stories in development, uh, uh, looking across the world at uh, developing economies. A thriving participatory, participatory democracy. You just had midterm elections with turnout that would shame the United States, and, and also changes in parties in many states and regions and districts. And you know, and not independence uh, winning. Yes, and some independence too. Very important. Uh, uh, which is again uh, remarkable. People think of a single party that was in control of Mexico for decades, but vigorous changes and 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 involvement. Uh, an ancient and rich culture uh, that very few people, frankly, know about. And most American tourists, when they go to Mexico, barely even see. And then in all the context about immigration, most people don't realize that net migration in Me to Mexico today is actually now zero, because the opportunities in Mexico, including now a high-tech sector, are so high. I just a couple of days ago, Ricardo read a, a Credit Suisse report on emerging, emerging markets. And it was very optimistic, not just about the economy, but actually about the politics as well. So, so let's, let's start with the economy, where you play such a large role as well. Just as a reference, just how, how big is the Mexican economy today? Well, thank you, Elliot, for all your, those kind words. I'm sure I don't deserve even half of that. And thank the audience for skipping the parade and having a free lunch here. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the best way to think about Mexico is it's really very different Mexicos. We could think about three different Mexicos. And the economy is related to that. So we have the northern states, which are almost fully integrated with the, the southwest <coughs> of the US. Then we have the middle Mexico, where most of the <coughs> industrial and, um, and labor force is located, and where most of the government and most of the growth is. And then we have four southern states, which are really poor, backward, and they're riddled with violence and uh, a lack of opportunity. And I'm talking about Michoacán, Guerrero, Oaxaca, and Chiapas. This is the, the bottom part of, of the country. So once you think of, of the country in those three terms, you can get a, a clear picture of what's going on. For example, the Mexican economy is quite large on, on purchasing parity. The income per capita is about $18,000 which is really quite high. And that's the average. So that means that some places like Mexico City or Monterey are way above that, approaching 40,000. And the growth rates are low on an average, I think it's two point something, I don't remember that. I don't, point, to put, I don't like to put too much attention to those GDP numbers. But in any case, the average is low, but in the state of Querétaro, which is central Mexico, we have 14% growth. So it has huge contrasts. And uh, you have to understand that when, when you talk about Mexico. And, and I think now the, the GDP overall makes Mexico, I think, the 15th largest economy in the world. And again, I think many people just don't have an appreciation of that. And yeah, it's 120 also- 120 million Mexicans, 120 million Mexicans. The median age is 27 years old, Amazing. okay? So it's a very young uh, uh, labor force, and they're highly motivated to improve. Mexicans still believe 
that if you work hard, you get ahead. Incredible, huh? <laughs> yeah, because most other countries, they believe in handouts. You know? So let's talk a little bit about NAFTA with 20 years ago and how important that was. We've been obviously hearing a lot about NAFTA recently in the context of America, you know, in the context of the Pacific Trade Agreement, European Trade Agreement. But what, is, what did NAFTA mean for Mexico? Well, it, it meant a huge change for our country. I mean, Mexico was a totally closed economy. You couldn't import anything. Everything required a license, a huge tariff. And uh, Mexico was basically like the moon. It was far away there, very difficult to get in there. All the industry was um, created in the post-revolutionary governments to support the domestic market. And the mainstay of the government income was oil. Now, after NAFTA, most of, those, uh, most of those industries that existed had to be closed down because they were so inefficient. So there was a huge uh, reconversion process. And the industries that we now have are extremely competitive worldwide. We have no tariffs. We have free trade with 42 countries. and. Um, the government has diversified its sources of income away from oil, uh, not as much as we would like, but now oil is 30% of the government budget. It used to be 100. And if oil prices were higher, the growth probably would be higher right now, too. That's true, too, yes. But what about NAFTA? Do you have a view about NAFTA and its impact in this country? I mean, we probably all remember Ross Perot's comment about the great sucking sound. Yeah, well, another Donald Trump, you know. <laughs> That's all we can say about that. But, there's so many misconceptions. You know, America has always been for free trade and for the interchange of, of ideas, and merchandise. You know, NAFTA was a, a very good, big step, a good step in the right direction, but it missed one thing. It allowed capital to flow, information to flow, merchandise to flow, but no people to flow, which is really dumb. You know, but at the end of the day, I think there's a big misconception here that most of the Mexicans who come to work here, you know, apart from being hardworking and doing their jobs right and all that, they want to go back to their country. They're, they really want to be temporary workers over here. And many of them are now going and back. And we should not confuse that with citizenship. I mean, there's many other countries in the world that allow temporary worker programs. And it makes sense. You know, if you can send some, some boxes with merchandise from here to there, from there to here, why could you not send some people to work there and then come back and, and separate that issue from the citizen issue? And, and, and what, what can we do now to make the economy of Mexico even more competitive? You talked about all those young people looking for jobs. And, and we have a similarly young population compared to most other developed countries in the world. Are there things that you think, as a business leader, can, that can be done to accelerate job development for young people in Mexico? Well, like I say, I mean, Mexico needs three things, education, education, education. But education is a very broad term. Uh, it's not only the technical qualifications that you require. It's also a mental attitude and some uh, values that you need to deploy to be successful. So that's why I'm so thrilled about those programs that we have, like the orchestra program. Because uh, more than being a music program, it's much more than that. It's, it's a human formation program, and it's something that adds to the fabric of society where these children live. Because it is living, it means living some very key values like excellence, discipline, teamwork. You know, that kind of thing gets you ahead in life. So teaching that as part of the education curriculum is so important. It's not just you know, technical stuff and being an engineer and doing that. I mean, you need that too. So you need those two. And then you need this, this attitude towards life, towards, like I was saying, you know, many, many Mexicans, most Mexicans think that if they work hard, they and their families are going to be better off. That's, that's a cultural thing. And that's one of our good parts of a culture. There's other parts of our culture which are not so good, which we need to change. And we'll talk about some yeah. of those, too. <laughs> cultural change is important. You know, Education, cultural change, values, those are the things that will get us ahead. 
Let, let's talk about the, the reforms uh, that, that have received enormous amount of attention of the Peña Nieto government. Uh, there, were, there were a number of reforms. The, the reform allowing private investment in oil and gas, uh, fiscal reforms, uh, 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 education reforms, and also diminished control uh, and, and diminished oligopoly in the telecom market. What do you think of those reforms? Which ones do you think are most important? And how are you doing? Well, it's been a huge change again. I mean, many other governments have tried to do these reforms and were unsuccessful. And I was highly skeptical, you know, because I was saying if you're going to do a bullfight, you do one bull at a time, not with five of them in the ring. <laughs> so it was kind of like that for Peña, you know. Uh, these five reforms are very important changes that affect <clears throat> the political balance and the structure of the country, and they pull them off. So uh, hats off to Mr. Peña and the team for doing that. Now, all of them are important, but I would say that, of course, opening up the oil, gas, and electricity sector is hugely important because of the size of that. And before, that was all government control. It was 100% government, government monopoly. Well, it still is. It's going to change. But right now, it's this. all the electricity is generated by one company, distributed by one company, and charged by one company. So you can imagine the amount of huge inefficiencies that are in that. As a state-run enterprise, what could we expect? Then all the oil and gas was explored, extracted, and processed by one monopoly company. So the, the changes <coughs> now are significant because any company, foreign or domestic, can participate in uh, exploration and in production. Now, th the rules for that are still being worked out. It's, we're getting there. It's a complicated business, but there's huge amounts of money involved in exploration and production. And also in energy production, any, electricity production, anybody can go in there and, and, and make some money. So. And, and you've talked already about education. What about education reform? My, my understanding is yeah. there was a, the, the, the teachers union in Mexico was extraordinarily powerful. Yes. And, and what, what changed there? And, and are we starting to see changes at the local level, especially in many of these rural schools where teachers didn't show up or you could, you could actually leave your teaching credential to your child? You know, it was an inherited position. Amazing, huh? Yeah, amazing. Well, again, it's a state-run enterprise. What can we expect of that? The educational system is the largest state-owned enterprise in Mexico. It's bigger than Pemex, the oil company. It's bigger than the electricity company. It's a state-run enterprise. So the government is the, let's say, the patron, how do you say that? No. The boss. The boss. boss. The boss. Employer. And all of these teachers work for this boss. The boss is hugely inefficient. And these uh, employees get away with murder. Isn't and, the boss in jail now? The, but, no, no, that's the union oh, boss. The union boss. The boss boss, the, the one boss that pays boss. the payroll okay. is the state. Now I'm at the union okay. boss. But she's in jail now, isn't she? Yeah, but the thing is, the, the, the union is d divided into like three different sections. One of the associations, the most moderate one, she was the boss of one, she got put in jail. The most extremist ones are still around and kicking, and uh, there must be like 300 of those people that just uh, upend our, our, our economy and our, our cities. It's, it's a mess because the government has been trying to put them in in place to get them to work, to get them to get evaluated, and to do their job as teachers, you know. So, but it's very difficult. You know, you've got 300,000 radical guys out there, you know, blocking streets and uh, making barricades. Again, and, and where do they come from? The poor states, Oaxaca, Chiapas, Guerrero. So you've been, you've been. It's not, it's not a coincidence that the poorest states present the worst educational performance and the worst leaders, the most radical ones, come from those states. And, I, and one of those, Guerrero, is where that terrible incident occurred with the 43 students who were abducted yes. and presumably murdered. And we'll, well, you know, that's a very interesting situation. You know, the, those 43 uh, students that were murdered, there's so many misconceptions about that. No, number one is that occurred, they were killed by the municipal police of a godforsaken town called Iguala. The, the municipality was run by the PRD, which is the left-wing party, totally antagonic to Peña Nieto. 
the state is run by a governor from the PRD, totally antagonic to Peña. And the students belong to a radical left-wing Maoist Marxist institute where they teach teachers to be rebel leaders. Okay, so I don't know if you knew about this. But you know, when they say 43 students, you think, oh my boy, he was there and he was there. No, no, these were radical activists. Maoists. That doesn't mean they can be abducted and murdered. No, 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 I'm not saying that. But just to tell you, how, how is it that Peña Nieto got to be blamed for this? I mean, he can be blamed for but many other things. But wasn't he blamed more for the general sense that there still is not a sufficient rule of law? In, in, I mean, in, in the, pol the polls still demonstrate that that is one of the biggest worries of Mexicans. Yeah, and you know why this happened is because uh, two gangs are fighting for the territory in Guerrero. They, they, they cultivate poppy, which I've seen some here, and very nice flowers. <laughs> we, we, don't get, we don't get the same <laughs> thing out of these poppies. But anyway, they're, so they're, they're fighting over this poppy trade or heroin, and it's terrible. There's too much money in the drug trade, so we should just make it legal and get on to something else. I was listening to a testimony by a, a judge here in Aspen Ideas, and she said, I unfairly convicted more than 500 people and sent them to their ruin because of these laws that we have about provision, which is just not working. A federal judge in Massachusetts from yeah. the first session. Well, I'm, we'll come back to, to drugs and cartels in a minute, but <clears throat> see, that, that is the key factor that explains all this horrific violence in my country is directly related to the drug trade. Well, let's stay on it now then. Yes. So what, what, what can be done about it? I mean, we're, we're sympathetic in that the demand for the drugs come from north of the border. The guns largely come from north of the border, but it is your problem. Yeah, so we should just eliminate our problem and make it and legal. How? You know, here in the States, <laughs> it's legal to carry guns. In Mexico, it's not. You think it should be legal in Mexico? No, but we should make drugs legal, and then you can handle the drug problem over here. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing to be gained by the prohibition, really. Both America and the U.S. should just, uh, Mexico and the U.S. should move ahead. Here in Colorado, it used to be illegal to smoke marijuana. Now it's not. You see them in every drugstore corner. So what happened? Nothing. Except that a lot of more people are not being put in jail for, for something that is really a victimless crime. So I think we've done enough to protect our kids. If, if our kids don't have the sense uh, to stay away from drugs, they should learn about it and, and well, move but, on. But, sure but the, 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 the cost of this <clears throat> goes way beyond uh, the youth protection. You know, because the justice system, I mean, America invented prohibition in the 20s. And then they had to backtrack in the 30s when they found out that didn't work. Why didn't it work? The justice system was corrupted. The judges were bought. The mafias were uh, buying everybody. Violence was rampant. That's exactly the description in our, my country because of this prohibition. So we need to end prohibition now. So, but short of that, Ricardo, may, you know, that may not happen that quickly. It may not happen at all. What other things that can, can be done? That, that can address this problem. I mean, rule of law, I, I, uh, uh, I, I think Lu Luis Rubio, whom I met at one of your conferences, just wrote a book, uh, uh, just was also translated into English, talking about reforms in Mexico and said, yes, there are these four reforms, the fiscal reform, the oil reform, the education reform, but the three reforms that matter are rule of law, rule of law, and rule of law. I mean, short of prohibition, what can be done? You had judicial reforms in 2008, but still many of the courts don't really work well. Many of them are, are corrupt. That, that reform hasn't worked well. Why isn't the president doing more on the rule of law reform? The thing about the rule of law is you have to have few laws that everybody can understand and we can keep up with them. Uh, when you have this environment where the, Producing new laws, a million words a second, it's very difficult to keep up. So it's just one aspect. The other aspect is our system of law in Mexico is not like the one you have here based on case and, and, and precedent. It's much more, uh, it's totally based, our system is totally based on codified law where things are written down. And that can change from today to tomorrow. That makes it more complex. But at the bottom line is that the whole justice system from the police to the investigators to the judge to the uh, penal colonies, all of that justice system is constipated, is blocked by the war on drugs. So 
police and prosecutors are very busy uh, chasing these people and putting them away. And then, of course, a new guy comes up in 10 minutes. But then th this whole system is not available to the citizens that need justice. Like if your car gets stolen or your house gets broken into, yeah. Yeah, that, I, they're I, not available for that because I mean, they're working on this bigger project. By the Mexican government's own estimates, something like 90% of crimes in Mexico aren't even reported. Higher Be, than that. It's higher than 90%. Yeah. It's and terrible. That, but I, now, we're putting all this as blanketing all of Mexico. Now, I want to come back to the three Mexicos that I mentioned. Right. No, all right? So the justice system in the four poor states is non-existent. But in the northern states, in the middle states, there's a much better chance. There's some states, like for example, Yucatan, uh, where Merida is, or Quintana Roo, where Cancun is, or Baja California Sur, where Los Cabos is, you have zero crime, nothing. Uh, I'm, as you know, I'm, so, a, I'm a resident of one of those states, and I love living there. And there is virtually no crime, you're right. But uh, so the, the, the thing changes a lot, huh? And, and From where you are. So, You've been going around the country, as I understand it, lecturing about cultural change yeah. in Mexico. What do you mean by that? Well, the, the Mexican culture is the result of a, of a fusion of two different cultures, the Indian culture and the Spanish culture. It has been merged and created a new one called mestizos. Now, we get some good things and we get some bad things from our parents. You know, So our, our culture of parents uh, on the on the indigenous side, were um, quite bloodthirsty. You know, they made human sacrifices, and uh, they liked to fight and kill people. And at the same time, uh, on on the on the indigenous side, there is a, a lot of um, bowing your head and just letting things pass. On the Spanish side, you know, we come from. Uh, the conquistador, and they, they do things, and they were the first entrepreneurs to do uh, business in the world. And that, but at the same time, they were coming from this world of privilege and titles. So having a title, the, the Marquez of the Valley, gave you the right to collect taxes and not to work. So all these cultural things make that Mexicans, for, we have a big distrust of, of rich people. If he's rich, he's got to be corrupt. There's no way he can make money and be honest. That's a big problem. So, and there's other things like that, you know, like, like, like the, the law. The law is, in our, in our country, the law is viewed as uh, made for the powerful. The powerful can get away with anything, and common people just have to take it. It's wrong. You know, one thing I didn't mention that I, sh I should have uh, is that Ricardo has also funded a very generous scholarship program at, for the Aspen Institute in the United States to bring Latinos, uh, Hispanic uh, uh, residents of the United States, to all of our programs, and it is already hugely successful. The Latino population in the United States is growing enormously. Its influence is growing. What do you think that will do to the future of the U.S.-Mexican relationship? What role will Latinos in the United States play, if any, relating to that relationship? Well, I, I think that, that we're also witnessing you know, the, the birth of, of a new culture over here. Uh, it used to be called Chicanos, but the, 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 the Hispanics, the, the Spanish-speaking speaking people in the US are a different kind of society from what we have in Mexico, because they're in a different kind of environment and they have to adapt and, and be successful in this environment. So it's, I wouldn't say that there's Mexicans in the US. This, uh, they used to be Mexicans, now they live in the US, and now they're a new culture. Uh, I, I think that, that it's amazing that we can see this growing in front of our eyes, and there's, there's ways of speaking and uh, ways of behaving that's completely different from Mexico. So one of the other things that, that, uh, that, that's been noted a lot recently, as a matter of fact, General Petraeus was here at the Aspen Institute earlier this week, and he was co-chair of a major national effort sponsored by the Council on Foreign Relations that suggested that 
North America, meaning Canada, the United States, and Mexico, should be much more engaged with each other and view itself as a force internationally. And that the report even suggested perhaps the most important thing for the future influence of the United States in the world is to think more of the United States, along with Mexico and Canada, two other countries, democratic countries with shared values. Yet people hardly ever think about Mexico in the context of a foreign policy. You don't extend your influence outside of your country. What do you think of this notion of a unified North America for purposes of international influence? Well, I think it's a great idea, of course. And um, that the one thing that's missing, in my opinion, is this ability to send people back and forth with ease uh, without regard to the citizenship question. No. Trade is a great uh, enabler of friendship and understanding. When, when I'm buying stuff from you or you're buying stuff from me, we need to talk, we need to understand, and there's a, there's a mutual profit in, in, in being um, trade partners. So uh, that has been going on with high success, and there's some things that, that still are obstacles, you know, but by and large, it's been a great idea. Now, in Mexico, uh, some people you know, joke about the United States and the, their relationship to Mexico. It's, it's like we're the, the good wife there waiting you know, at home for the guy to come back at night, and uh, we don't complain. And well, maybe well, we should complain a little more. <laughs> I, in, in a minute, and I'm going to turn things over to the audience in a few minutes, but I want to end on, on some discussions about your vision, how you see Mexico, say, in 2025, at the quarter point in the century. But before that, I started mentioning that you don't have any business relationships with Donald Trump. What was the reaction in Mexico to what he had to say? Well, it's, 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 a, it's a very offensive thing to say, you know, and, and a horrible generalization, which it's hard to describe. I mean, it's really idiotic. So you know, most people will brush it off and say, well, you know, stupid person saying stupid things, and that's it. But some other people do get really offended. They even made some piñatas. You know? I, saw, I saw the pictures of those. They made, because it's very offensive what he said. You know? So, crystal ball, 2025. Uh, will Mexico have largely resolved these rule of law problems? Will the economy be growing at a rapid rate? What will its relationship be with the United States? Will we be more integrated? What, what do you see down the road? Well, predicting the future isn't what it used to be. You know? <laughs> see, I think it's very difficult as a businessman to see 10 years down the road. Uh, more than I can, I can talk about my wishes, about the vision that I would like to see, where we would like to move to. But changing a, a country and, and moving ahead, it requires time. And 10 years goes by really fast. You know, really, really fast. And the older you get, the more you realize that. You know, Ten years you just blink and pff, it's over. So, you know, the the country being so young is still learning a lot. And those uh, a median age of 27 is going to get older, and it's going to be more knowledgeable, and hopefully more educated. So. Mexico will move from, from uh, as it already, had, already is moving fast, from a low value-added labor to highly value-added labor. And because of the strategic positioning of our country next to the U.S. in the same time zones, uh, the, the ability to do uh, high-value logistics and high-value manufacturing like, like the auto manufacturing already is, is booming in Mexico. Booming. We have these huge plants. All of those televisions are made in the north of Mexico and medical equipment. And the, so that will continue to get better. Now, also, you have to think that the connectivity, the internet, is going to change everything for the whole world, not only for Mexico. So having our country connected with very high speed fiber optic, which we're doing in one of our companies, and with wireless high speed connectivity, also opens up 
incredible possibilities for development and productivity. Now, the only way that you can get a high paying wages is if you have investment in productive capital equipment that makes labor uh, productive and you can pay those wages. That, that, that's what's happened in Germany, for example. So we will see a lot more capital investment and now there's a big if. If our country continues to be stable, if our governments continue to be uh, forward looking and attracting investment, then we will have this capital investment, we, then we will have these higher creating, higher paying jobs that we, that we need so much. But it might not happen, you know. Uh, things can go different ways. Of course, the, the Donald Trump quote was in the context of immigration reform mm -hmm. in the United States. How important is U.S. immigration reform to Mexico? It's important to know that our countrymen are over here in, in a state of limbo. But it's, it's not really that Mexico has all these people to send to the U.S. We have a hard time hiring people ourselves, you know. So, uh, and you'd be amazed to see the level of, of income that uh, mid-level and high executives have in our country. They're way above the U.S. Again, a mid-level high executive in Mexico makes much more money in Mexico than in the U.S because of the scarcity. So it's not that Mexico is actively pursuing immigration reform so that Mexicans can go and work in the States. No, no, it's not like that at all. It's just that we, many of us in Mexico believe that the way the Mexicans are treated over here is not right. And, and one last question, and so then we're gonna bring microphones to the audience. <clears throat> you know, we talk a lot about issues with immigration at our southern border. You have your own southern border immigration issues and you know enormous problems in Central America flowing through Mexico, sometimes all the way to the United States, sometimes staying in Mexico. Tell us a little bit about that and the future of that problem. I mean, are people in Mexico talking about building fences between Mexico and Guatemala? No, I, I don't think so. When you go to the, the border with Guatemala, if you've ever been there, it's very interesting. It's a huge river and it's full of jungle. There's no way you could build a fence. I mean, and it's the same people, exactly the same people, one side of the border to the other side of the border. They happen to be divided by this political agreement. But at the end of the day, it's the same people, it's the same culture. It just happened to end at one side of the river or the other. But I think, again, what's happening in Honduras and Guatemala is especially worrisome because those countries are small. They don't have the resources that Mexico has, and they just cannot deal with the crime problem originated by the drug trafficking. So those countries are very close to a failed state. And the people there, we have businesses in both of those countries, and it's a disaster, a disaster. Why? Because the government just can't handle it. Again, we, they need prohibition fast so that they can move on to other stuff. And that is also affecting Mexico. But thank goodness, you know, our country is 120 million. It, the state is, is a powerful state. And, and once the state sees a place, an area where there's problems, they'll dispatch the forces there and they'll take care of it. The problem is that they jump here and then they jump there and then they jump there and it seems that no progress is being made. But, but there is, there is progress. But um, our neighbors in the South are having a very hard time. And I don't think a fence was going to take care of any of them. Uh, I don't either. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's open it to the audience uh, right here. And then, and then we'll go back here. But I, do we have two microphones? If, if, yeah, if the people with the microphones could find the people whose hands are up, that way we can keep moving quickly, please. We've talked a lot about this conference at this conference about income equality in the United States, inequality. We are fortunate enough to spend some time in central Mexico at San Miguel de Allende and have seen what's happening in Querétaro and in Guanajuato and it's, it's very impressive and we see many, many middle class, upper class Mexican family tourists in that area. But my impression is that income inequality in Mexico is even worse than here. And I'm beginning, I'm wondering if the government or any institutions are implementing policies that might address that. 
Well, you know, it's become very uh, much in, in vogue to speak about income inequality, but then we have to clarify. What is it that we want to uh, address? The gap or the poor? Because the gap you can address real easy. You know, like you expropriate my riches. I'm one of the richest guys around. Okay. So we'll give it all to charity. And now I have been reduced to the same income of poverty of everybody else. We have taken care of the gap, and there's no more inequality. Is that the case? I would say that would be just a symptom of envy, which is a very powerful human sentiment and motivator. Now, if we're talking about the poor people and raising them to a better level of income, that's a different problem. And we know that the only way that people can make better income is by having a better paying job. Again, it comes back to investment in, and productivity and higher, higher wages. Investment, not only in capital equipment, but in education. So at the end of the day, that's the only way that, that you can get uh, uh, people out of uh, the poverty level. Now, having said that, um, the poverty in Mexico is um, in different manifestations. Most of the, of the really poor people are in those four states that I mentioned again, uh, Michoacán, Guerrero, Oaxaca, Chiapas, directly correlated with lack of investment in education, with lack of investment in infrastructure. And, and nobody's going to set up business there. You know, I, I've discussed this at length with President Peña, and he's coming up with this uh, special economic zone idea. But you know, the tax man, they just don't get it. If, if a car company is setting up in Leon, what would it take for them to set up in Tuxtla, which is in, in, in Chiapas? It would take a lot of incentives for them to do that because it doesn't make any sense. There's no infrastructure. There's no educated people. The logistics are horrific. So if, if we really want to uplift those four poor states, we need to do some major changes in terms of incentives to investment of all kinds, investments in education, invest in infrastructure, and capital goods. Not yet. OK, please. Um, yes, my question is a personal one. Ignoring net worth, how would you contrast yourself with Carlos Slim? <laughs> <laughs> Carlos is a very, uh, a very smart person, and, and we used to be actually very close friends for a long time. And uh, he, he helped me to buy TV Azteca from the government when it was privatized. Uh, he was part of the loan syndicate. So I have a lot of respect for what he has done. Now, uh, Mr. Slim bought Telmex in 91 in, in that privatization. And even speaking with President Salinas years later, and uh, I questioned him and asked him, well, why did you give him the monopoly of Telmex for such a long time? He says, no, 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 no. We didn't give him the monopoly of Telmex for such a long time. The succeeding governments extended the terms of his monopoly up until today. So it is now until last year when the government of Peña really decided to take this head on and to create a conflict with uh, the Slim Group that reform was finally put in place. And now we see the, the results. You know, I sold my business to AT&T, and AT&T has invested $7 billion in Mexico to create a top-of-the-line, world-class 4G wireless infrastructure. It's going to be hugely competitive, and it's going to put uh, the, the, the slim group into, uh, into really competition mode, which is what we needed. So, I'm much, much more of a builder of companies. I'm not a buyer of companies. Um, I'm more of an operator, and he's more in the financial sector. And of course, the, uh, he is much older and has more experience. He's been around for a longer time than I have. So uh, it's an interesting match. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> you brought up the analogy of the war on drugs to prohibition in the U.S. in the 20s and 30s. I'm just curious whether you think there is any realistic discussion occurring in Mexico and Central America about legalizing the drug trade. Um, if there's not today, do you think there's any potential for that to happen in the coming years? 
and what would you put the odds of a legalized drug trade in Mexico and Central America over 10 years? Well, let's, let's all, uh, go step by step because you know, it's, it's a big thing. You know, we call the salami problem. How do you eat a salami? You cut it in slices and then you, because if you try to get the whole salami, it's very difficult. So, so the first step is, is marijuana. That's the first step. And we're looking very closely at what's going to happen in California. If California is successful in legalizing marijuana, then in Mexico, it'll move much easier. We already have some really good examples, like DC, Washington, DC. This is the capital of the empire. It's legal there, legal here in Washington, and uh, Washington State, Oregon State. So that's a good first step. Uh, but more needs to be done. What, what happens in, in my country and the other countries is we are really scared, the governments are really scared of the US government power reigning back at them. It, to be deemed as an unfriendly neighbor. But I think that that could be addressed in some other ways. It's, it's, it's not about being unfriendly or not friendly. It's that it just doesn't work for anybody. So it is a complex problem. We have to start with that. And now I have to say this. I'm not at all for drug consumption. I think it's, we have plenty of drugs already, legal and illegal. We have alcohol, tobacco, amphetamines, all kinds of drugs. They're bad. Anything in excess is bad. Sugar, fat, carbohydrates. You have too much of that is bad. But it's beyond the point. It's, it's not about being good or bad. It's just that it doesn't work as a, as a prohibition. Do we have a question over on this side? Yeah, please. Thank you. The work you're doing with the orchestra is so incredible and beautifully philanthropic. And so you're a, film, a Mexican philanthropist. My understanding is there aren't a lot of you. And so I feel that philanthropy would be a huge help to the problems in Mexico. How can we get there? Well, you know, I like to think of myself as, as a businessman with social responsibility, and that means elaborating. As, as a businessman, you have to have customers, and they have to be happy with you. Otherwise, they dump you, and you have no more business. Also, your, your employees need to be happy so they can take care of your customers. So running a business is one part. And then having social responsibility is the other. Because at the end of the day, our businesses exist not in a vacuum, they exist in a society. And if society is better off, our businesses will be better off. So it's very simple. Now, the thing is, first you gotta be successful. I mean, a poor businessman cannot be philanthropic. A, a struggling company cannot be philanthropic. And uh, it's been rough in Mexico to be successful. You know, I've been really lucky, uh, but, but more could be done, yes. And we also have a, a very interesting group in Mexico where we have the universities, we have other businessmen and working together. And we made a, a big list, an inventory of all the social action programs that we had together. And it was amazing, it was like 500 different items. But they're dispersed efforts. So one of our big ideas and uh, Juan Ramon de la Fuente from Aspen was there. He's the chairman of Aspen, Mexico. He, he was there at that time. He came up with the idea is, let's pick one program that all of us together in a united way kind of way could push through. And it came to pass that, that we're pushing one program which is entrepreneurship. How can we get people to become entrepreneurs so they can make their own money, make their own investments? And, and it's, it's coming along, but more can be done always. Let me just add to that, though. It's a very, very astute question because when we were starting Aspen Mexico and we were talking to various people, talking to the U.S. State Department, the Mexican ambassador of the United States, one thing we invariably heard was that Ricardo Salinas really sets the standard for social responsibility and philanthropy in Mexico. And the hope is that other people as successful or nearly as successful as Ricardo would follow your lead. Well, so, thank you. So, I'm sure I don't so, deserve that. But, well, yeah. no, that's what they said, so it's true. Uh, let's go to the middle here, if we can. Hi, thank you for today. Um, I wanted to talk with you about human trafficking. I understand that uh, there's a route that takes place between South America through Mexico to the United States. And um, 
I would love to know if you could just talk a little bit about what you're, what you know is happening with respect to human trafficking in Mexico. And just to, a shocking thing for me to discover a couple years ago is that we actually have human trafficking right here in the Roaring Fork Valley and that they had discovered a house up on Red Mountain where a number of the victims were actually trafficked. So that was a very shocking thing for me to discover a couple years ago that it's actually here in my backyard. Well, again, uh, the, the human trafficking problem is directly related to the uh, lack of immigration policy into the U.S. Because when, when you're in a society like Honduras or, or Guatemala or some of our southern states and, and you want to leave because you see that there's no future for you, what do you think? I'm going to go and look for a job. So many of them emigrate to the Mexican cities, you know, Guadalajara, Mexico, Monterrey, or Leon. But some of them say, no, we're going to pursue the American dream, and they, they start to move north. And it's very difficult, you know, to, uh, to get around. So they hook up with people who show them how to avoid the law and the borders and how to get in. But once they're with those people, then they are illegal, they're underground, and nobody will step forward to protect them. So they're in a very vulnerable position, especially women. So uh, again, it's, it's directly related to the lack of, a, of, a, of an immigration policy. If, if we had a temporary worker program where people could sign up, register, come up, and then uh, work and go back, it would be a win-win situation for everybody. Over here. <clears throat> I, uh, we met a couple days ago. My name is Milton Mendez. I, I come, I'm a son of Salvadorian immigrants. I grew up here in the Roaring Fork Valley. Um, my question to you is actually, as a Mexican citizen, what your opinion is uh, in terms of immigration into the United States from Central American countries, specifically Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, and why is it that those countries are the ones that are the most at need at the moment um, in terms of immigration policy? Again, for the same reason that I mentioned is the drug violence in those countries, El Salvador, or Las Maras, and Honduras also, uh, are being torn apart by the lack of the rule of law. The, the police, the justice system, the judges are incapable of protecting the citizens. So the citizens, especially in the more vulnerable parts, need to get out of there. And they vote with their feet. They just leave. It's a terrible, terrible situation in terms of human cost. So it's, it's related. You know, we need to stop this prohibition that gives these drug gangs a, a, a huge monopoly profit that should not be there. You see, once you take away the profit, they can't survive. So many people say, well, but if you took away the profit of the drugs, they'd take some other criminal endeavor. Well, that's true. But it's easier to deal with a poor criminal than with a rich criminal. <laughs> and the state is richer, right? So you, it's, it's a better deal. And it's, it's really sad what's happening to El Salvador and Honduras, Guatemala, because these are, these are very nice countries. Most of the people are very peaceful. A small minority involved in, in trafficking is contaminating the whole thing. So that's why we see this push coming up to the US. Time for a couple opinion. of questions. Uh, way over there, if we can get a microphone, and then right here in the front. Is there a microphone over here? Um, we've spent a lot of time this week talking about the emerging competition between China and America. And Mexico plays such an interesting role as kind of a, a part of our NAFTA agreement, but also with a lot of commerce with China. And China, of course, in Central America is giving money to create a second Panama Canal. We've just changed our relationship with Cuba, the, the communist com country on this side of the isthmus. Talk to us a little bit about Mexico's view of this emerging competition between China and America. Well, <clears throat> the first thing I would say is, is China is just a, a world unto itself. I mean, it's 1.3 or 1.4 billion Chinese. And, and the Chinese believe that they have a rightful place in the world, and they're going to 
defend it and fight for it, and they have very high military capabilities. I mean, this is completely different from, from the Mexican situation. Mexico is 120 million, you know, maybe 10% of the, uh, our vocation has never been militaristic. We have always been a peaceful country. And uh, we demonstrate that with all these trade agreements that we have, as I said, more than 42 trade agreements. So we, in Mexico, we believe in, in much more in the service economy, in tourism, in taking care of people. Uh, and we don't see the competition with the US. Uh, we see a much more of a collaboration and a complementary relationship. But I think the United States would do well to show a little appreciation for this little neighbor down in the south. Because as I said, we don't, give, don't make trouble, so we don't deserve any attention. It's always much more sexy to talk about Syria and yeah, Iraq and Iran and China. These guys here, oh, they're okay. Yeah. <laughs> right here. Uh, thank you for a really interesting talk. And um, I definitely agree with you on issues of the drug um, industry and the importance of changing our focus and limiting their ability to disrupt. But I've recently been in Mexico in um, Chihuahua, mm -hmm. and there have been a lot of um, forced disappearances there. And we talked with some of the organizations who are trying to get justice and stop these things. They seemed very random, and I asked a couple of the people who were involved with um, having relatives disappeared. And I, I said, it seems so random. Who's doing this? Is it the police? Is it the government? Is it the drug trade? And they looked back at me and said, they're all the same. It does seem that a big part of the problem at this point is the corruption um, within the police and within many of these local governments. And since it's going to take a while for, if it really ever happens, for the drugs to become legal, I'm wondering what your thinking is about what could be done to improve the independence of the judiciary and the professionalism of the police. Well, yeah, like I mentioned before, the, the, the horrible situation in, in Iguala, where the 43 uh, uh, students were murdered, that was done with the full cooperation of the local municipal police. That's a big problem because if you have, in Mexico we have like 2,500 municipalities. If each one is gonna have their own police force, it's very difficult to uh, control and to train. So one of the initiatives that Mr. Peña has put forward is to put a national police force and a state police force and take away the policing faculties from the municipalities. Now, I have some other very good friends who are in the municipal business, you know, and they feel very strongly that that should not be the case, that the municipality should still have control over the police forces. So I really don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's very bad. It's a very bad situation. But at the end of the day, it's all generated by the same problem. These gangs have a lot of money that comes from the US market. And then they also have a lot of high powered guns that come from the US. If we cannot stop that, it will be really difficult to, uh, to achieve justice. And, and that's true, you know, the, the average citizen has to deal with this. Now, there's some rays of hope, for example, one of the first orchestras that we made was in Ciudad Juarez. Ciudad Juarez was famous because of all these disappearances of young women. Well, now Ciudad Juarez has completely reversed its uh, index of criminality. I'd like to think the orchestras have a lot to do with it. We have four orchestras over there. And, and I've been told by, by many of, of the people there that they really think that the orchestras have made a big, a big change, you know, that the social fabric has come back that the self-esteem has come back. Now, I don't know if, I'd like to think it would be that, but I'm sure there's some, some other things going on. Well, and, and no pun intended, that's a good note, I think, to end on. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Ricardo Salinas, thank you. <laughs>